Um, we have the lovely author, David Kennerly. Yeah. And former club kids, writers, superstar, amazing fashion icon, Eddie Glant. Ernie Glant. Yeah. So, um, I'm going to leave it to them. I got a stutter, sorry, I need another drink. Um, there's, uh, we're going to pass it off to the guys here. They're going to talk to you about this fantastic book, Getting In. And uh, just about all that time. I was on the West Coast during this period of time, so I would pop into New York, and so I only caught like the last bit of, you know, like Splash and like that. But I loved and heard so many amazing stories, and also have friends that have gone to so many of the great places that we do not speak of much anymore. So let's have a round of applause for our boys getting in. supporting uh, us this evening. Uh, wanted to thank you, um, Tom and Henri of Maison 10, not only for hosting this talk tonight, but also really just accepting getting in to be part of their highly curated, curated show. And it's just, it's just an honor um, because we love, we love everything. I want one of everything. <laughs> So, and also, now I want to thank Ernie Glam, the forever young club kid who's been making contributions uh, to the book and to supporting me after its publication. You're welcome. And uh, it's funny you should mention curation because I was thinking that uh, a lot of the clubs that we're going to be talking about were very highly curated, especially at the door. <laughs> <laughs> they were not inclusive. How, how many of us would get into that? Uh, or dependent on the club. <laughs> but we're very super casual these days, and uh, that didn't go well nearly like this. So let's get into it. David, can you talk about what drew you to the New York City club scene? Okay. Um, I moved to New York City at about 1990, and I was in my upper 20s. And to be honest with you, I really didn't have any friends. I was sort of struggling with my identity um, and my sexuality. Um, so one night, my roommate's like, okay, I'm taking you out dancing. And we're gonna go west side, 18th Street in Chelsea to this club called The Roxy. Who knows The Roxy? <laughs> So he took me there, and I have to say, I didn't know what to expect. I walk into this cavernous dance floor, and I was just gobsmacked by this huge, hundreds and hundreds of people that looked like they were having the time of their lives. And it was this like heady mix of drag queens, muscle, muscle guys, lesbians, um, straights, and club kids, and you know, skinny geeks like me. So I kind of felt like I had found my tribe. So it's basically your friend thought, okay, I need to teach him how to swim, so I'm going to throw him. Yes. <laughs> in the most extreme pool. I yes. Think Into the deep end, yes. <laughs> well, you survived. Uh, what made you want to keep all these nightclubs? I mean, typically when you would come out of the Roxy, there'd be a whole phalanx of people passing out the, front, uh, the invites. And uh, a lot of them ended up on the floor. Yeah, no, so... That was the thing, is that that was the main way of promoting clubs back in the day, was through these printed club flyers. And so, you know, because I was so new to the scene, everything was exciting to me. And so I'd walk out, and the sidewalk would be carpeted with these club flyers. And I'm like, what are you doing? You're throwing these really cool pictures away. There's like really cool drag queens and hot, you know, hunky guys. And so I'm like, I decided just to start collecting them. And I kind of became a little obsessed. Some people might even say a border. Um, yeah, but uh, I, I just was—I just loved the, the dazzling images. I mean, there were celebrities, DJs, drag queens. I really, I really enjoyed it. So by the end of the decade, because I went out mostly between 1990 and 1999. And by the end of the decade, I managed to collect 1,200 of those flyers. So, um, so thank you for doing that. You love to do more than in this book. So um, 
That's a great uh, public service, I think, because uh, a lot of this was basically a phone run that is meant to be thrown away and certainly not the best. And if you did keep it, you would only really keep it for like a week or two because typically those invites were uh, discounts. So if you brought it to the club the next week, they would give you either let you in for free or give you five dollars off. Okay. So uh, I wanted to ask you, you know, when you were putting the book together, you decided to interview scenesters. Was it hard to find the scene people? Um, you know, the, what, what I tried to do was, I was like, okay, I want to make sure that I interview people who come from all corners of the nightlife scene in New York City. And also, I, I wanted to interview some of my idols that I always had like kind of crushes on. So I would interview um, drag queens like Lady Bunny and Linda Simpson. Um, DJs like Larry T and Susan Morbido, who's still very much spinning now. And, um, and then there was this go-go boy named Mark Allen, who I just had such a crush on. His image was in all these club invites. And so the idea that I could like, I somehow tracked him down through social media and um, just interviewing him, like I'm finally talking to this crush I had 30 years ago, and it was just, I don't know, it was, it was kind of cool. I think half the Roxy had a crush on him. Um, <laughs> but he also, he's so smart, and he's written for the New York Times, and he's, you know... Did you invite him tonight? Uh, he lives, he lives in oh, Hudson, yeah, yeah he, so he's kind of far away. We would invite him Yeah. And then of course, well, of, of course, uh, I also enjoyed interviewing club kids, such as Ernie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, you know, I wanted to ask you, how did you decide what clubs you were going to focus on? Because you probably had a lot of invites for lots of clubs, and there's only so many, so many words you could write. So, how did, how did you figure that out? Um, well, because I was only going out in going out in the 90s, I knew to focus just on that one time period. And I just went, I mostly focused on the clubs that I enjoyed and that I was able to collect club invites for. So, but what was kind of amazing with the 90s, it was what I call like a perfect storm. And uh, because it was, it, it was like an explosion of venues for nightlife for LGBTQ people. And some of those, factors of the perfect storm were real estate, because in the early 90s, Manhattan, believe it or not, was still relatively affordable, and there were fringy areas like in um, uh, the East Village, and, and especially the, uh, city. the, the Meatpacking District. So there were a lot of clubs there. And another factor was that they came up with these club guides, one in 1991, HX, I don't know if anyone ever remembers, looking through HX to figure out where to go out back then, and Next Magazine. So they had these really well-researched uh, club guides. And then another factor, sadly, is the AIDS crisis, because during that time, I mean, by 1990, 90,000 people had perished from HIV AIDS, at that time when you were, if you got diagnosed with HIV, it was, you know, tantamount to a death sentence. So that was a period where people, LGBTQ people, had to come out of the closets and like into the streets and go into the clubs. The clubs became almost like uh, safe havens for these people and then community builders. So we would go to these clubs and then I would say many, many, many of the club invites talk about that the, that the parties were um, benefits for causes such as GMHC and ACT UP. That's right. So let's talk about the clubs. Uh, let's start with the really big ones. Which which was your favorite ACT UP club? Um, I have to say it was my my first club, the Roxy. And what was cool about it was it was actually built in 1978 as a roller disco. And then in 1990, it became more of a gay-centric club um, when I started going out. And it's one of those things where you, like, you walk up this gradual staircase, 
and then you finally emerge into the dance floor, which felt it felt like the size of a football field, right, Bernie? Well, it yes, but actually, more accurately, it was the size of a roller skating rink. <laughs> <laughs> really big roller skating rink. Yes. It was. Right, and so there were these two bars yes. uh, at the end of each mm -hmm. dance, uh, right. end of each end of each floor. floor. Yeah, like, and then the, the big oval where you were, would skate. Right. Yeah. So, so they had the bars, they had these hunky go-go uh, boys dancing on the bars. And what I also loved was, at least the nights that I went, there would be these mylar streamers everywhere, there would be drag queens like Lahoma Van Zandt taking this roll of toilet paper and literally skipping through the dance floor <laughs> and wrapping it around the, the dancers. And it was just this really fine atmosphere. And like, You'd come home and you'd find glitter in your underwear. <laughs> now, Dee, you're talking about the uh, the early Roxy from the early 90s. But yeah. There was a different flavor of the Roxy later in the 90s. Can you talk about John Blair's Roxy from the late 90s? Yeah, yeah. It was I mean, a they pretty were, different scene. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, once he took over Saturday nights and gradually throughout the 90s, uh, he really wanted to focus on attracted much of the gay fans. And back, we had a term back in the day called the Chelsea Boy. And what the Chelsea Boy was, um, he was muscular, clean cut, and hairless. And so they would feature these pictures of these, of these Adonises on these, these club invites. And it was just so, of course, I collected those a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and what, it, it's also important to realize that I mean these really were works of art. I mean they were shot. These images were shot by Sean Khalil, and he had a real photography studio. He paid the models real money. Like it was an actual real works of art. And um, so I wanted to celebrate those as part of this book, as to sort of these unsung artists. I wanted to make sure that they got some credit because people were just throwing their stuff on the sidewalk. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so so nowadays, as most of you know, they don't really use those printed flyers anymore, and so they're digital, and if they create them, they're maybe just swiping images of hot guys off the internet, or they're using, generating from an AI, I don't know, all I know is that it's not, it's very different than it was back, <laughs> back in the day. Yeah, you could take it home and lust after it. <laughs> yes, yes. And I did. And then, <laughs> and then the, the Roxy uh, was basically shut down in, uh, I think, 2007. And then they knocked it down and now it's this luxury condo. It's important to note, though, about the Roxy that it had, in terms of New York City nightclubs, it had this amazing run because it ran all through the 90s and through yeah. the early 2000s. It was packed on weekends. And, and even in the 80s, before it became uh, this kind of fashion-y, uh, hipster-y, and then circuit guy uh, nightclub, it was uh, a hip-hop and roller skating ring. So, right. I mean, the, the, there were the big freestyle scene took place mm -hmm. at the Roxy uh, in the early to mid-80s. So, I mean, it, it was a club that lasted like at least 20 years, and that was the home of all these iconic uh, music scenes in New York City. Yeah, yeah. So now let's shift gears and talk about Ernie's favorite club, the Limelight. Yeah. Woo! Yay! <laughs> Anyone know, remember that? Um, and actually, the building is one of the few clubs where the, the building still exists. It's that church on 20th Street and 6th Avenue. And what was so amazing is it was the, the building was built in 1850 as an Episcopal ch church. Uh, in the Gothic style, and so when they turned it into a club in the 80s, they made sure to keep some of the details. So the stained glasses, those big arched wooden beams, the wainscoting, and even a couple of the cubes. So they kept that vibe, which only made it more fun, because here you were basically sinning. While <laughs> <laughs> a whole lot of sin. Yes, exactly. Um, and then it the limelight closed. It, 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 it changed names a couple of times at the end, but it basically just faltered as a dance club um, in 2003. So, Ernie, what do you think made that club so fabulous? Uh, well, one, mostly it was in a church, so that, I mean, 
It's probably the most outrageous thing about it. Uh, there were a couple of iterations of the limelight. So the first, when limelight first opened in the early 80s, that was the first cool limelight where it was more like a, kind of like a rock and roll type of place. I know Billy Idol used to go there a lot. I, I remember Grace Jones was there a lot. And that was like the fashion-y limelight that only, that only lasted like two or three years and then it kind of fell out of favor. And then it became really horrible. Like <laughs> horrible like suburbanites would go there on the weekend. And I remember by the late, by like 1989, uh, the, the promoter, Michael Lally, took me there and it was just like, he said, we're gonna start working here. And when he took me there, I was just kind of cringing by the people who were there. And it's like, we have to, throw parties for these people. Did they said, have a, like a, a jello wrestling? Yeah, there was, like, there was <laughs> the night I went, there, there were women wearing bikinis, jello wrestling in these kiddie pools on the stage. And all that. So that was the entertainment and I was just horrified, but, um, but you know what, they paid us to do it. So we, <laughs> we, we did it and it turned out great. And then there was another limelight, the, the Club Kid Temple limelight, which lasted from 1990 till about 95 when the limelight became insane and then techno music exploded and it became the, the church of techno and uh, and long lines again. And that, that's, I think, the limelight that a lot of people remember today. Right. You know, not so much the limelight from the 80s. And what did, what, what did you get paid to go gallery? Well, I, 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 my job at Limelight was to dress as Claire the Carefree Chicken, so I wore a chicken suit and <laughs> my job was to stand on the stage and dance. And sometimes <laughs> I would swing on this swing over the dance floor right. and I think they paid me like $150 to, <laughs> to do it, which I thought was good money back then because uh, I really only did it for like two or three hours. So I, in my math, I was getting paid like $50 an hour mm -hmm. to to wear a chicken suit. And I, frankly, I would have been there anyway. So <laughs> <laughs> give me the money and I'll put on the chicken suit. <laughs> so you mentioned Grace Jones. Um, did, didn't you have like some sort of story about her? Yes. Uh, so uh, Grace Jones would come to the limelight a lot because I guess she was good friends with the owner, uh, Peter Gation. So they, it was a New Year's Eve and she was asking us to give her ecstasy. And uh, so we, I didn't have any ecstasy that night. I don't know why we didn't have it. Because <laughs> we always had ecstasy. Uh, so, but I did have decongestants in my <laughs> So I took this decongestant and like, we very like grandiosely poured it into a bottle of champagne. And then uh, the promoter, Michael Alec, handed it to Grace and said, oh, we just brought, got this from Amsterdam. <laughs> and then she looks at it and is like, that doesn't look like ecstasy. Because <laughs> you know how her, she's always like smile talking like this. Uh, and it's like, oh yeah, yeah, you know, so she drank it. She, she was not stuffy that night. <laughs> That's my favorite Grace Jones <laughs> So what, there's another part that, it was almost like a contest that happened at the limelight that a few people had told me about with different outrageous stories. And um, it was, wait, what was it called? It's called the Hot, hot, body, hot body, body Contest. contest. Yeah. So and you, in, in the book, you recounted one story of one particular evening. Do you want to share that with everybody? Be, very quickly, I will. Uh, Disco 2000 was the Wednesday night party that I worked at. And we had this competition called the Hot Body Contest, where basically by the end of the, like 2 o'clock when people were drunk, we would offer them like a hundred dollars if they would take all their clothes off on stage. So you'd be surprised how many people went on stage and tried to take their clothes off. So we made it a competition. And then there was this one night where this really hot guy came up and he decided he was going to take his clothes off. And there was some drunk woman who was going to take her clothes off and she was determined to win the money. So they got down to, the guy took off his shirt and everything. And then all of a sudden he took his pants off. And then it turned out that he didn't, he, he was, he had like a missing limb, like mm. part of his leg was cut off. So then he's like, so everybody's screaming because he, the naked guy, amputee, is like, you know, strutting. And then he takes the prosthesis off and starts <laughs> So then the crowd is screaming, yes, yes, take it off. And then the, the woman who was getting desperate because nobody was paying attention to her, just went up to the stump of his oh. amputated leg and started like dry humping it. Oh. And then the whole crowd just starts screaming and laughing. It's the funniest thing, I'll never forget. <laughs> I still think he won though. Yeah. <laughs>
So what I liked about the limelight was they had these special parties for gay men on sort of the off nights, like Wednesdays and Sundays, and one was called Lick It, and the other one was called Res Erection, with the <laughs> emphasis on erection. And so the, they featured a, a back room called the Lick It Lounge, and so it was for friskiness, but they actually had back then monitors, like guys that would go in with flashlights, making sure that things didn't get too wild. So, uh, but their, and so their invites were really interesting. And in fact, one of them was this gorgeous, it featured this gorgeous, and it's in the book, it's featured this gorgeous shot of this male couple um, having sex. And the photographer was Steven Meisel, who what? was extremely uh, famous. <laughs> Prolific back then. Yes. And so, uh, anyway, the headline was, was, safe sex is hot sex. Because that was the mantra, the message that needed to be communicated back then in order, so basically, wear a condom if you're gonna find. So that was, so I love the fact that these club invites and these clubs, they weren't just to have a good time, they were also, I mean, help, you know, educate people and save lives. Yes, and they had like a dark room at that party, and I remember that party would go on on Wednesday nights when, when I would be wearing the chicken suit in the other part of the club. <laughs> so, and then under the chicken suit, I had my whole club kit thing with makeup and everything. So sometimes just to like throw a wrench into the dark room uh, scenario, I would sneak in there in my crazy club looks, and then all of a sudden like turn on a light or something, so that, you know, just to scare like the <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and another mega club back then was the tunnel, and uh, some people might, the, the building's still there, they're renovating it into this sort of luxury office space, it's the Chelsea Terminal Warehouse, and it takes up one of those enormous blocks between um, 27th and 28th Street and 11th and 12th Avenues. So, but back then, it was this enormous club. And uh, it was well known for its hip hop and gay centric parties. And it had a pretty good run. It went from the 80s to 2001. And Ernie, I know that you have had some experience with the tunnel. Yeah, well, I worked there too. Uh, and uh, the tunnel was actually the birthplace of the club kids because the club kids scene started in the basement of the tunnel sometime in around 88 or 89 and, uh, and moved on from there. So, yeah, it was. It was a great club, and uh, I don't, you know, I love, there was a DJ in the bathroom, so. <laughs> it was one of the first clubs where they just decided, fuck it, you know, gay guys are gonna go in the women's bathrooms, and, uh, and so are drag queens, so let's just not even have gendered bathrooms anymore, and it was way ahead of its time in that era. But it also, it had, I, it had a bartender in the bathroom, yes. too. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it was a big bathroom. <laughs> Um, so, I don't know, what would, um, what would you, uh, rem what do you remember about the Palladium, which is another big mega club during that time? Uh, the Palladium, uh, well it opened by, by, it was opened by Steve Rubell, and uh, I do remember the opening night, which was chaotic, and I couldn't get in, because they had to close the metal barriers, but it was a fantastic club, it was humongous. <laughs> There was this room uh, in the basement designed by Kenny Sharp, which was Technicolor and wild. And I remember one time sitting there with my friends, and we were all in our like club regalia. And then Rick, the the funk performer, Rick James, came in. And I don't know if, if any of you remember what he looks like, but he would always have these really long braids, and he was dressed in full leather. And he just walked in and looked at us, and then like turned around and walked. Out. <laughs> like, so we chased the celebrity out of the. <laughs> well, there were a couple of parties at the Palladium that were gay-centric. Um, one was Bump, with yeah. that exclamation mm -hmm. point, and one was Arena, and that featured and had a residency of the DJ Junior Vasquez, who was probably one of the big names of DJs back during that time. Yeah, and, and funny that you should mention Bump because it was like, when they say Bump, I mean, they were kind of referring to drugs and eventually right. uh, Mayor Giuliani closed down um, the Palladium and Limelight and the tunnel because he thought that they were drug supermarkets, which 
I mean, maybe they were. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a very unsubtle name. <laughs> So, um, smaller clubs now. Yes, let's yeah. do the smaller clubs. So one one club that I noticed that wasn't in here much was Boy Bar, but right. you did mention other small clubs. So what? How did you decide what clubs you were going to focus on in the small? Club yeah, department? I mean, again, it was more my favorite. I, I mean, I, I was being biased. It's my favorite, and which ones that I had the most club invites with. And also, in this case, the, what I want to talk about now is Splash, is because I feel that when Splash opened in 1991, it ushered in a new era of gay clubs, because, or, I mean, gay bars, it was large, they had high ceilings, a row of windows overlooking onto the sidewalk, so like anybody who walked down the street could look in and say, oh, there's gay dudes, you know, together making out or whatever, and that was very different than most of the gay bars before that time. The ones before were almost like cave-like, and they were kind of dark, low ceilings, and if there were windows, they were often painted black. I mean, and there were no signs often to even say that it was a gay bar. So um, it just felt like the 90s really were ushering in this new um, era, and in 1991, Splash, I think, was at the forefront of that. And if anybody's wondering why it was why it was called Splash, it was because there were showers in there that were like shower stages. So guys would be naked taking showers, and everybody would be watching. And I remember there was even from the bathroom you could see like the naked guys taking showers. And I remember there was a certain urinal that I couldn't use because if I was there looking at the naked guys, I wouldn't be able to pee. <laughs> Okay, so um, <laughs> now we're going to shift gears to, uh, there's another space called Bar Room 432 that later got rebranded Mother, and it was on Far West 14th Street, and they had these wild and crazy parties, I don't know if anyone remembers something called Jackie 6 um, and also the Click Club uh, for women and, the, and, you know, and, and their friends. And, um, and Meats, which I loved because it was really down and dirty and grungy and it actually had a little back room and they played like pretty extreme porno. Uh, but I, what I liked was their, um, their clubbing lights because they were just these sort of images, collages of naked guys that were just photocopied, like they went to Kinko's, I don't know if anyone knows what that is, um, and they would Xerox them on these brightly colored cardstock, and those, I just really love them, and, and, and um, some of the phrases or the headlines that they used were, hard on, go-go dudes, yeah. and suck grooves, which I don't know what that means, but it just sounds really good that I wanted to check it out. <laughs> Yeah, their invites were kind of a throwback to the 1970s, like punk rock aesthetic, because by that time period, like the big mega clubs were doing these very sleek, highly uh, graphically designed invites. So that was their reaction yeah. against that. Did you have a favorite party there? Oh. Uh, my favorite party at Mother was Click and Drag, which happened on Saturday nights. That was kind of like the cyberpunk, gothy, industrial party. And uh, so yeah, that's, that's the one that I went to most often. Cool. So okay, now we're just down to one more venue, a smallish venue, and it was the Pyramid Club in the, in the East Village. Yeah. Yeah. And it was a drag, drag centric perform, drag centric performance space, and it was considered like a, a van, like a vanguard of um, a counterculture. And it's where a number of drag queens got their start, like Lip Seca, yes. uh, Lady Bunny, uh, RuPaul, Sister Dimension. All of them got their start way back in the 90s at the Pyramid Club. It was actually the 80s. Uh, you're right. You're right. It, the 80s. Thank you. Um, so is there any... Do you have... Any stories? Uh, well, <laughs> I, I have a lot of stories from that club. I moved to New York in 1984 and immediately started going to Pyramid because that was a happening club to go to, especially on Sunday nights. So I remember my favorite story is when I, I went all dressed up in my outfit and what, I went in and I remember the performer John Sachs, who was this uh, kind of burlesque uh, style of a performer who sang Hollywood style music. He sang a lot of James Bond songs. 
fucking his ass. <laughs> anyway, he was really cool back then, and I remember him coming up to me and saying, wow, I really love your outfit. And I thought, oh, and I was like 21 at that point. I'm thinking, oh my God, John Stacks likes me. I almost wanted to just like kneel and kiss his cock ring, but, <laughs> which I knew he was wearing, but he was fully clothed. Like, <laughs> That's my favorite story. John Stacks said he loved my outfit. <laughs> can, so, you remember, can you remember the outfit? No, I can't. I, all I remember is him saying that. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, as Ernie mentioned, there's so many, many clubs. There's almost a hundred, I think, that we have mentioned in the book to some degree or other. And tonight we just wanted to touch on some of our favorites. Um, but that's pretty much all we have to say. I don't know whether there's any questions. Hundreds of questions. <laughs> <Very good. laughs> right, oh, hands up question. I see David Cash right over here. David Cash, what is your question, young man? Um, Thank I'm you. curious, at, at its peak, how many club kids were there? Then and even now, how many are kind of in that clique and if you're still friendly with one another as you were back then? Um, like back then, it, it was kind of like a scene of about, uh, I don't know, maybe like four or five hundred people, I would say. And a lot of it was college students, FIT, um, Parsons, and um, School of Visual Arts. That, th those were the big uh, sources of club kids back then. I don't necessarily... When you say, a lot, are there a lot of club kids today, like, are you talking about the people in my cohort or yeah, like the yeah. children? No, yes. Oh, uh, no, 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 there aren't. Like, I'm probably, the, I almost never see people my, from my cohort out in the clubs. You know, no, they, a lot of them don't live in New York anymore. And, uh, and then the ones that do, they just don't want to go out, their feet hurt, I don't know. <laughs> Any more questions? There was one back here. Jill Williams, what is your question? Speak up loud, please. <laughs> and I, yes, yes, and I want to hear about the whole impromptu fast food restaurant party. <laughs> oh, you mean wow. the, out, okay. the outlaw party in McDonald's? Whoa, 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 whoa. Sorry again. She's asking about outlaw party. So um, the promote the promoter Michael Alec, whose party was Disco Two Thousand. He would do these outlaw parties that were kind of like these flash mobs where he would pick a place and then give out free liquor and have a DJ until the police came. <laughs> and in the late 80s, you could have a party like that in New York City and, it, and, and you would run out of liquor before the police came. Because <laughs> like, the police didn't care really, unless somebody complained vociferously. And then as the 90s progressed, when you started getting into the Giuliani, Giuliani era, the Parties might only last like 15 or 20 minutes before the police came, and then you'd have to you know, leave or they'd arrest you. So what we did with McDonald's is that in, the, like in 1989 or 1990, he decided to have a flash mob at the McDonald's in Times Square. <laughs> so um, I and all these other club kids and drag kids, we all went there, and he, ordered, he orders like 200 hamburgers and 200 french fries. And, so they make it and then we go upstairs and, and there must have been like 300 people that went up into the dining room and they're all clamoring for like a, a fucking cheeseburger like they, never, <laughs> like they never had a McDonald's cheeseburger. So he gets up on a table and starts throwing them and I was standing on the other side where he was throwing them too and I noticed that because people were fighting so much trying to get the wrappers, they, the hamburgers were coming undone and like the, the patty flew that way, the bun flew this way. So then I was running around behind us and picking up the hamburgers and then I went back to the front so that he could throw the hamburgers. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, when we ran out of hamburgers, the, some of like the, the hip hop boys that used to follow us around got mad and then they started vandalizing the McDonald's and breaking the chairs and tables so it turned into this little like a gay riot at uh, the McDonald's in Times Square, and, and then the police came. Next question. Yeah. <laughs> Here we are. Yes. Yes. Hi. 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 Um, so you talk about all these experiences that you had back in the '90s, and unfortunately, for like for someone like me, I wasn't old enough <laughs> yeah. to experience all of these things that you've enjoyed. All right, do you see any of this? Um, in today's time, are there places where people can go to today that can experience these experiences that you have? Actually, before very we good. answer that, there's very been good. a few good. people commenting on Instagram Live saying, where do people go now? I own a bar, <laughs> and I, there aren't even people to kick out and I turn the lights on at the end of the night. <laughs> oh my gosh. So, who's going to answer this one? Well, I mean, I, I, I don't go out as much as I used to, 
uh, and certainly, mo I mean, most of what we're talking about is Manhattan, and now things have migrated uh, elsewhere to Brooklyn and Queens and even beyond. And I know there's some great spaces still. I mean, like for instance, recently there was a horse meat disco party um, at the Knockdown Center, which people were just raving about. And they just had, the, you know, in their mind, they, they had as good a time as we ever had. It just, it's just slightly different because, you know, they're standing there taking Instagram shots of themselves. <laughs> um, no, it's, I mean, it's, I don't want to compare one to another. Uh, I think that the three, three dollar bill um, has some great events and parties. Um, and so, so and, and even in Manhattan, there are a couple of places Especially during Pride, there were there were all these. I think circuit circuit parties are making a comeback, which are the big, huge mm -hmm. parties that um, are like maybe just like once or twice a year, and they attract people from all over the world, really. Mm -hmm. But and anyway, so um, you know. But if anyone, I, I I know you've been out to some places as well. Uh, well, I still do go out, and it's, yeah, like, there really aren't scenes like those that existed back then, because people, our society has changed, and cultural norms have changed, so you don't necessarily have the unhinged craziness. I mean, you do, like, the nightclub basement in, underneath the Knockdown Center in uh, Masspeth or Bushwick, whatever it is, um, <laughs> Like, that, those scenes there are pretty wild. I mean, you know, I don't want to talk about them at length, but there's like wild scenes going on there. But it's not a fashion scene. It's not, a, it's not people wearing like crazy clown makeup like the, clown, like the club kids did. There's, there's no drag queens. Uh, but it's still like intense in a way that uh, is very like 2024. And uh, so I would recommend that. But like, yeah, like, I mean, there aren't, you're not seeing flash mobs. Everything's very commodified now. And I don't, I don't think that there's the same unhinged edge um, today that there was back then. You know, we're, we're a much more controlled society and everybody's very self-controlled now. And also I, I, I curated because I have had people say, oh, I used to do all kinds of things because there were no cell phones for people to, to record me. Yeah. And now there's always that chance that I could be recorded. So it maybe inhibits people a little bit more. Yeah, there is a general atmosphere of inhibition, and uh, and I, and then there's so many rules too. Like you walk into a club, like in the old days, there would be some bitch at the front that would, <laughs> that would not let you in if she didn't like you for whatever reason, you know. And it didn't have to be fair. It was just like, no, you can't come in. And now they don't really have that. But instead, the equivalent of that is like once they've let taken your money and let everybody with money and there's some sign saying oh don't be racist don't be homophobic don't be this don't be that don't touch anybody and it kind of uh you know so i feel like the first when you're greeted with all these rules or when you're greeted with somebody who's gonna the first thing that they do to you is tell you everything you can't do when you come in the club it's kind of a downer metal detectors and pat downs and things like that Right, next question. Who's David, I have a question. One, one thing that, uh, for me, and I, I want to hear your experiences, both of you, is the music. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, Roxy for me was what DJ was playing on that Saturday night. Yeah, I mean, it was yeah. a really important part of what drew me to the dance floor. I mean, it was a DJ. Yeah, right. Talk about your, can you talk a little bit about your experience yeah. with the DJs? You talked about a little bit about uh, Junior Vest, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Susan Morbido. I mean, cer you. certainly, and, and again, the, the flyers bear this out is Absolutely. is to see it's interesting to see the evolution where in the beginning of the 90s like the DJ's name was like kind of small and then as the decade wore on it got bigger to the and then it was like oh no there's Junior Vasquez is the whole star of the uh, the club invite so it was really interesting to see how they started to become more of a celebrity, but certainly that, that, that was the question we would always ask, who's spinning? Um, and, he, and my favorite music from the 90s was house music. And uh, you know, I, I guess I like a little melody here and there and, and some lyrics uh, in a normal fashion. <laughs> but yeah, so, um, but no, it's, 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 um, it, it's great to see like a chronicle of all the DJs 
that that spun, yeah. and sadly, many of them are, are no longer with us. Like, well, Frankie Knuckles is Frankie yeah, yeah, right there. It was a huge yeah. budget. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's still pretty important. I mean, it was important in the 90s. It's important today who's yeah. DJing. And it was in, kind of important in the 80s. To, I mean, to me, it was always important. Yeah. So, but um, yeah, I mean, it, it's pretty, the DJs are pretty prominent right now. Like, I mean, that's how you decide what party you're going to, basically. And you experienced the same thing in the 90s when you were doing your thing, that the DJ really was... It was imp important. Yeah, the DJ was important, and the DJ was always on the invite, because yeah. everybody wanted to know. Shifting gears a little bit about what people were wearing at the time. I'm sure it's a club, but it's a very specific look, but compared to what people were wearing. For example, in the basement, the knockout center in 2024, what are your thoughts about the differences, or are there no differences? Do you think there's a fashion scene in Brooklyn and Adam? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah. No, no. Hard, 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 yeah. Hard, yeah. Hard, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's a it's a very casual. We're in a very casual time period right now. So um, yes, there's not a lot of fashion. Uh, I mean, some people dress up, but yeah, back then it was. You, you had to dress up because if you weren't dressed in a certain way, you wouldn't be allowed. That bitch at the door would not let you in. You know, so you had to turn it out. You you had to bring the party. You well, had to, at, at especially least, the VIP area. Yeah, like I never got into the VIP area, but one of the things I liked about the Roxy was I would just wear my faded jeans, my black boots, a white or black t-shirt that came off within 30 seconds of walking <laughs> through the door yeah. and, and maybe a, a, a piece of netwear and, and that was what I liked that was, but that was maybe because it was the rock scene it was the John Blair night or whatever but those were the types of parties so I didn't feel you know uh, I, I did not dress up that, that's why I love that Ernie's here because he provides we're sort of two sides of the same coin that, that fashion did have a very important role in getting into clubs. Yeah, and it was everything, the fashion. It was like, it could be high designers, yeah. or it could just be like drag queens and club kids making their you know own couture at home, because a lot of them went to FIT, so you know they could turn yeah. it out. Yeah. And uh, so yeah, it was like wild stuff, and then it was really beautiful, expensive clothes from Barney's, or yeah. from, you know, Sachs. All right. yeah. Another question, so more questions. Yeah. My question was going to be, what did you wear, David? You just answered it. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> All right. What's the most iconic invitation in your book? And could you talk about it a little bit? Um, let's see. I guess for me, there is an image. It's a Photoshopped image because they did at one point have Photoshop in the 90s. And it is for a club called Purgatory, mm -hmm. and um, it, it was a night, and it was at Sound Factory Bar, and it was a picture of Bill Clinton, because this was like 91, 92, um, with his arm around Al Gore, <laughs> and they were shirtless with really short, 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 like cut, white cut off shorts. And it's in the book. And what I just loved about it was because it's it, it was to remind people to go get out the vote, like to go register to vote. And obviously, it was promoting the Democratic ticket. Uh, so, and it was just ingenious how they photoshopped the heads onto these really hot guys. And, and actually, I spoke to Mark Allen, the go-go boy that I had a crush on. So um, he said that his body was used for one, I think, was Bill, Bill Clinton during that photo, the photo shoot before they photoshopped you know, Bill Clinton's head. So, so, that, so that's probably the most memorable. Yeah. I'm going to be naughty here and put a spotlight on. So Neil was probably the first person to get a book here. Yes. And he just told me upstairs earlier that he was an actual go-go boy. Oh. Yeah. 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 But, so I once at me, and they paired me up with Mark Allen. And I said, really? Of all the go-go -go boys, this is who you pair me up with. Yes. Yeah. I was just going to ask, what's the perspective? What's the go-go boy perspective? on the club kids and these big clubs. And Everyone that. seems sure they are. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. Okay, time for a couple more questions. Yeah, we have a little bit more time. I've got one more, more. Over to you guys. Bonnie, stop choking to death, please. <laughs> <laughs> and the other question? Before I jump back to you, Bonnie, what was the question? Okay, so, let's, let's, uh, okay, so um, 
You say you still go clubbing. David, a little bit. A little bit. Where do you both go? You want to go first? Or yeah, I'll go because it's fairly short. <laughs> I, I actually go to the Eagle. Oh. And what's great about the Eagle, and I, I wish it has morphed into just in the past couple of years into a big, a bigger dance club now because they expanded it um, for many, many years. It was uh, narrow and had the pool table and it was wonderful and then they did have the roof. But then they, they put this whole wing of this dancing and they've got go go boys and named DJs like Susan Morbido. Mm -hmm. And it feels like I, I was just there Saturday night and it feels like a real dance club and everyone's got their shirts off and everyone's doing their enhancements and it, it just I, it, you know I, I was just I was just I had a great time okay, okay. thank you Ernie? Uh, my favorite club is the basement uh, nightclub underneath the knockdown center I love the rec party uh, but it's very hard to get into that party these days because it sells out so fast and I also love the bound party at the uh, basement and that is like a mixed party where there's a lot of uh, straight and bi people there and lots of women. And the reason I like it, aside from that, it's a fetish party, so it's the closest thing to a looks party that is like the 90s. Uh, I also like the fact that it, it just kind of brings this whole uh, atmosphere of what the nightclubs in the 90s were like in New York, especially if you were to go to like some really cool club that wasn't attracting lots of you know tourists or suburbanites. Uh, it, it gives like a really strong vibe of of like a fetish, fashion-y looks club uh, from the 90s. So I recommend checking it out, but you, you should dress up for that. You can't just go casual to that. Every time you say the word suburbanite, people comment, they love it. Describe a suburbanite A suburbanite. I say suburbanite, like back then we used to call them the bridge and tunnel yeah. people. Yeah. So, uh, it's a little bit more like, you know, like PC. Yeah, yeah. so uh, I mean, there's, look a, it up. there's nothing wrong with being a suburbanite. It's just that once the news of a party made it to the suburbs, you know, then, you know, it kind of lost its cool edge. And, and the thing is, like some of the parties, they were still cool and people were hearing about them because famous people were going to it. Uh, and so they would want to try to get in, but they couldn't and they would just be outside in the way, you know, you'd have to push your way through them to get in. <laughs> and very last question. Yes. Again, I'm getting the eyes from my husband. Yeah, time. Okay, you mentioned Grace Jones. Everybody's probably a super fan of Grace Jones. Who else was the most other, well, the most famous person you met in your club? Okay. In your mind? Yeah. Um, go start with him first. <laughs> well, my favorite people that I met uh, in the 90s uh, who came to our party at the Limelight were, was John Paul Gaultier. Mm -hmm. That was a, a pleasure that he came. I loved, well, I got to meet and become friends with Lee Bowery, the British oh, performance artist. Oh, yeah. He came to our club many times because we flew him. We basically paid him to hang out with us. We loved him. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I also thought it was really cool that the Pet Shop Boys came. So oh, I, yeah. 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 So, I was flattered that they came. And then like Terry Mugler was there and Claude Montana came. So like a lot of the big fashion people came to our party and it, we got to meet them and say thanks for coming. And it was just, it was fun. Cool. Great. So, I mean, for me, it was more, I guess, there's a contrast between me and Ernie. I was more of this sort of like the guy on the sidelines, not <laughs> wanting the attention and still having a great time. I didn't get my drink tickets. I didn't get into the VIP rooms that often where all the celebrities were. Um, but I just, I mean, the one night that I remember uh, where a celebrity like brushed against me <laughs> was, was, was uh, um, when Marky Mark had his uh, song, uh, Good Vibrations, yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess it was called, yeah. um, at the tunnel, and he performed um, for, uh, for um, New Year's, actually. It was New Year's Eve. And he just happened to go to, on his way upstairs, like he kind of like brushed against <laughs> me. And um, yeah, but we never, we, I never seen him again. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have a round of applause for our boys! Woo!